My name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. I'm going to be speaking about point of care ultrasound today with respect to the abdominal aorta. So with all abdominal ultrasound, we're going to have focused questions uh, as we approach the patient with our ultrasound probe. So the focused questions for the abdominal aorta are what is the diameter of the aorta and what are the diameter of the iliac vessels. So um, iliac uh, and abdominal aneurysms can be very tricky. They can present in a variety of different ways. And in fact, um, Sir William Osler was quoted as saying, there's no disease more conducive to clinical humility than aneurysm of the aorta. He described in some of his many writings uh, difficulty in diagnosing this illness. And back then, there really wasn't any treatment, this treatment being primarily surgical. So people lived with aneurysms until they died from their aneurysms. And he described aneurysms as large as a patient's head in some cases. Um, on post-mortem examination. So why do we care about this? Well, we care about this for patients like this gentleman who was uh, admitted to an emergency department for syncope, and he had a relatively normal EKG, a normal laboratory evaluation, and a fairly normal physical examination. Maybe some mild uh, abdominal tenderness, but nothing terribly focal. And um, is uh, being admitted, and for observation and the standard sort of syncope evaluation, and a bedside ultrasound was performed because he had some mild abdominal tenderness, and this was found. And what this is, of course, is the focus for the rest of the talk, um, but uh, what it represented for this patient at this particular time was a bit of a time bomb. So were the symptoms of uh, his syncope related to his aneurysm? It certainly is possible, especially in the absence of other causes. And there's some literature to suggest that aneurysm is not only common, we know that, but uh, it might be a bit underdiagnosed. So how do we miss something um, that might be present right before our eyes? And the idea is to keep an open mind uh, about patients that might have aneurysm and keep a low threshold for considering this diagnosis, especially in patients with uh, syncope, flank pain, uh, abdominal pain. So how frequent do we see abdominal aneurysms? Um, 5% of the population of patients over 65 has an abdominal aneurysm, and it's double that rate in males, so 11% of males over age 65. It's in the top 15 causes of death for patients over the age of 50, and 11,000 of these rupture annually. The mortality for a ruptured abdominal aneurysm approaches 90%. Um, of the patients that survive to the emergency department setting, about 50% die. So the uh, necessity for diagnosing these very rapidly and getting patients to appropriate surgical care is really critical. And that's really going to be the focus of the, what we talk about today, how you can rapidly and accurately diagnose abdominal aneurysms at the bedside. So what are some common complaints where you should consider abdominal aneurysm? So abdominal pain and flank pain are pretty standard. People generally recognize those. <clears throat> And um, back pain and syncope are um, other things to consider. I'm not suggesting that every single patient with syncope uh, should have an evaluation with uh, ultrasound, but it's something to consider when there's no other cause and uh, just have a, uh, a decent threshold for suspecting this. So our common physical exam findings with aneurysm would be a pulsatile abdominal mass. Well, 20% of patients with um, abdominal aortic aneurysm don't have a pulsatile abdominal mass. So our physical examination, as usual, isn't terribly sensitive or specific for this finding, whereas point-of-care ultrasound can be very sensitive and very specific. Several studies demonstrating a sensitivity 94 to 100%, sense specificity 98 to 100%. Um, and these are several studies in the emergency medicine literature. One of the first studies of aortic aneurysm actually cut straight to the chase. Uh, an article by Dave Plummer in 1998 demonstrated that patients with suspected AAA who were evaluated by point-of-care ultrasound had an average time of diagnosis of five and a half minutes and were in the OR in about 12 minutes. Patients who went to radiology for a CT scan were diagnosed on an average of 83 minutes and were taken to the OR in 90 minutes. So not only really a huge difference in the amount of time it took to reach diagnosis, very impressive in this study. It only took the patients about seven minutes to go to the operating room once the diagnosis was found in either case. So what do the numbers look like? I told you that we're primarily going to measure the abdominal aorta and we're going to measure the iliac vessels. So normally, the aorta is under two and a half centimeters. Most authors describe 
aneurysm as being a 50% dilatation in the aorta diameter. So again, most agree that about three centimeters is the cutoff for describing an aorta as being aneurysmal. The risk of rupture uh, increases exponentially with the size of the aneurysm, so you would be less concerned about a 3.1 or 2 centimeter aneurysm than you would about an aneurysm that's 5 or 6 centimeters. So 20 to 40 percent involve the uh, iliac arteries, and for those vessels, we expect them to be less than 1.5 centimeters. So anything greater than 1.5 centimeters for the iliac arteries is aneurysmal. Another important thing to keep in mind is that we're not going to be able to detect rupture of the abdominal aorta very well for several reasons. We don't necessarily detect fluid around the aorta with ultrasound as well as we would detect it with CT scan. And it's very difficult to evaluate the retroperitoneum with ultrasound. So intraperitoneal bleeds only really represent about 25% of abdominal aneurysms and 75% of retroperitoneal. So seeing free fluid in the abdomen is uh, is unlikely to be found even in the setting of a ruptured aneurysm. And there are some authors who believe that a retroperitoneal uh, rupture might be somewhat more stable because of the ability to tamponade the bleeding in that more confined space. So again, we let off by speaking about focused questions, and the focused questions for assessment of the abdominal aorta are, is there an aneurysm? Is the aorta greater than 3 centimeters? Are the iliac arteries greater than 1.5 centimeters? So uh, we mentioned the accuracy a little bit earlier. Here's one study in an emergency department population where 125 patients suspected of having an abdominal aortic aneurysm were evaluated by ultrasound and either radiology department ultrasound or CT scan, MRI, laparotomy, some gold standard. And the sensitivity was 100% in detecting aneurysms, and the specificity was 98%. So it not only demonstrates that at the point of care, uh, emergency physicians and perhaps other providers could detect aneurysm, but it also demonstrates um, why many patients with aneurysm are followed using ultrasound over time instead of exposing them to radiation uh, and the increased cost of uh, CT scans over and over again as their aneurysms are followed. So quickly to review the anatomy, the abdominal aorta is everything below the diaphragm up until the point of bifurcation of the iliac vessels. So that is going to exist a bit to the left of the patient's midline, running right along the uh, vertebral bodies anterior to the spine. Just to the right of the aorta, you see the inferior vena cava, and they'll run right along each other throughout the, uh, the entire abdomen posteriorly. The, um, Iliac bifurcation occurs around L4, around the level of the umbilicus in terms of surface anatomy. So we really want to visualize the abdominal aorta for its entire length. So from its first branches, from the celiac um, trunk to the superior mesenteric artery, around that area of very proximal aortic uh, uh, abdominal aorta, down through the, the bifurcation of the iliac vessels. And again, most of the aneurysms you're going to find are going to be distal and not proximal, so it's really important to visualize the entire aorta down through the bifurcation. So here's a CT scan image just to orient us. Uh, this, for a lot of people new to ultrasound, is a more familiar anatomy. So in this view, the patient's right is on your screen left. The patient's left is on your screen right. Their head is behind the screen, and their feet are towards you. So we see here, working posterior to anterior, the vertebral body, and just anterior to that, off to the patient's left, we see this large dilated uh, aortic aneurysm surrounded by a rim of calcification, and there's some contrast filling the lumen here. Just to the right of that, on the patient, from the patient's perspective, is the inferior vena cava. So this anatomy here, the large vertebral body, the inferior vena cava, and the uh, abdominal aorta is going to be a good landmark for you as you follow the aorta from its uh, origin just below the diaphragm down to its bifurcation. So if we superimpose uh, th this image of an ultrasound done through the same area, we see very similar anatomy, in this case through a normal patient with, without an aneurysm. 
working from the back to front, we see the vertebral body again. It has a different sort of appearance here. It has a bit of a horseshoe shape, and there's shadowing coming down behind it. And the reason for this is that the ultrasound beam goes from the top of the screen towards the bottom of the screen. As soon as the ultrasound energy hits the uh, anterior or superficial aspect of the vertebral body, it shadows down because it doesn't penetrate beneath it. So just like my hand will cast the shadow from the light, the ultrasound beam um, strikes the vertebral body, which casts a shadow sonographically behind it. So that leads to a slightly different appearance because this crescent shape is really only the anterior portion of the visualized vertebral body. Just anterior to that, we see the abdominal aorta. And just to the patient's right of that, we see the inferior vena cava with a bit more of a, an almond shape, a bit flatter. Just anterior to the uh, abdominal aorta, we see a smaller artery that is surrounded by a bright white echogenic area, and that's a bit of fat surrounding the superior mesenteric artery. Anterior to all of this, we see liver texture. So liver up top, aorta here, superior mesenteric artery just above that. To the patient's right, we see the inferior vena cava, and behind it, vertebral body. So keeping these things in mind, we know that we are now in a relatively proximal part of the abdominal aorta, and that's a pretty good place to start as we scan more distal from here. So we're about to take the machine to the patient. Which probe do we select? So of our options, the curvilinear probe is generally most widely used in the point of care as well as in the radiology community. The curvilinear probe um, has a lot of crystals and they travel in a relatively uh, parallel fashion without a lot of spread as it uh, travels into the body. There's, there's a bit of spread as the sector widens, uh, but not as much as you would get from a phased array uh, or, a, or a tightly uh, wound curvilinear probe. So a uh, curvilinear probe at a relatively lower end of the frequency range, somewhere between uh, 2, 3, 4 megahertz, will give you the best uh, compromise between good image quality, resolution, and the ability to penetrate deeper into the body. A lot of patients that you're to be concerned about abdominal aortic aneurysm uh, are going to be heavier uh, in their abdominal area, and you might have to penetrate relatively deeply to image the abdominal aorta properly. You also have to deal with issues of bowel gas, so having a wide footprint um, curvilinear probe is going to typically be your best option, but a phased array probe that could uh, uh, balance benefits for cardiac imaging as well as abdominal imaging can be useful as well if that's what you have to work with. So let's start with the probe in a transverse orientation. You're going to start just below the xiphoid process, relatively in the midline, and aim the probe marker towards the patient's right-hand side. And we're going to start in the subxiphoid area and scan inferior towards the feet right about to the level of the umbilicus. And um, that's going to give us the, a view from celiac axis all the way down to the iliac bifurcation. So most um, authors recommend uh, four to five views of the abdomen, uh, of the abdominal aorta. Typically, the, the idea is that you're going to, me to uh, uh, evaluate the entire aorta. So it's not like you're just taking individual slices. You're going to follow the aorta in real time and really look at every centimeter of it. But in terms of saving images, it's helpful uh, if you're not saving video clips, at least to save four to five images. So somewhere through the proximal aorta, which is going to be around the level of celiac or superior mesenteric artery, and that's going to be just below the um, xiphoid process typically, a little bit further down near the um, renal arteries with, to the mid aorta. You want to look through the distal aorta as well, just above the iliac bifurcation and you want to evaluate the bifurcation point as well, all in transverse view. <clears throat> we also want to check for the longitudinal view, and that is, again, best done distally because the most common area to find aneurysms is going to be distal. So what do these images look like? Well, again, we see the anatomy was described before in this proximal view of the aorta. We see the liver in the near field here and curving around towards the screen left. We see the um, uh, superior mesenteric artery here surrounded by a bit of a rim of fat, which makes it light up and, and that brightness can highlight it. Just below that, we see the um, abdominal aorta. Uh, 
To the patient's right, to your screen left, we see the inferior vena cava. And here we have the uh, vertebral body down below as well. You can occasionally see in between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery, the left renal vein coming across, so in between those two structures and uh, meeting up with the inferior vena cava. And you can see the splenic vein crossing on top of or superficial to the superior mesenteric artery as well. So the splenic vein here, uh, and it's slicing through this um, in, in real time, you would see it curve around as it travels from left to right transversely across the abdomen. Just anterior to the splenic vein, you can see this slightly darker, I'm sorry, slightly brighter gray echo texture here of the pancreas. So uh, just above the pancreas, just superficial to the pancreas, we can, uh, to the superior, um, to the splenic vein, you can see the pancreas. So from top to bottom, one more time, liver, pancreas, splenic vein, superior mesenteric artery, left renal vein going transverse into the inferior vena cava, the aorta, and lumbar spine shadow or vertebral body. As you go down more distal, there's less anatomy to appreciate because most of what you see at this point is bowel, but we see the aorta and the inferior vena cava, again, on top of that brightly echogenic anterior edge of the vertebral body. Going down a bit further, we see the iliac bifurcation. The iliac arteries are going to bifurcate um, before or more proximal to where the iliac veins bifurcate. And here we see two circles, dark anechoic areas that represent the iliac bifurcation. Here again, we see them um, labeled where the two crosshairs represent the iliac arteries sitting on top of the vertebral body. Here's a transverse, uh, I'm sorry, a longitudinal view um, going through the uh, mid aorta, and we can see the uh, bright echogenic uh, area back here represents the anterior edge of the vertebral bodies, which you see bright over here, bright over here. There's the aorta, inner lumen, and we see the superior mesenteric artery coming off here, traveling um, inferiorly and a little hint here of the celiac axis coming off just superficial or just uh, proximal to that. And here's another view, um, a little more distal in the aorta where we don't see the superior mesenteric artery anymore. So here's a real-time scan through a real patient. Um, this is done actually with a phased array probe, so you can see that you can get decent images with that probe as long as it's in the, in the abdominal mode setting. So we start here in the proximal aorta, and we're scanning distal, distal, and then you notice that the um, iliac vessels are bifurcating. On the way through this path, as we loop continuously again through seeing the aorta, we lose it with some bowel gas, and then we see the bifurcation happening. So starting again, aorta, lose it with some bowel gas, bifurcation. So. I'm not suggesting that uh, we can find every patient's aorta in four to five seconds, which is how long this clip takes to visualize this patient's entire aorta, but it doesn't have to take very much time. So a couple of things to keep in mind when you're looking in the transverse, uh, the sagittal view or the longitudinal view of the aorta, it's important to look at the largest diameter that you can find. If you send your ultrasound beam here represented by this bright green through the central diameter, you'll get the true diameter of the vessel as it shows up on the ultrasound screen with bright echogenic lines anterior and posterior and anechoic in the center. But if you go off center, you're not looking through a diameter anymore. Mathematically, you're looking at a chord, which is uh, a line that intersects the edges of a circle not going through the center of the circle, and that's going to give you a false sense of the diameter. So make sure as you scan longitudinally through the aorta, and this is true with any vessel like the inferior vena cava as well, that you're looking through its maximal diameter to get the accurate measurement of the diameter. Again, here we see an example of the uh, iliac vessels. Uh, nicely demonstrated. There's the iliac arteries here and the uh, distal aspect of the inferior vena cava, which is not yet bifurcated. And it's, again, really important to visualize the iliacs because you will find aneurysms that affect the iliacs. And here is a longitudinal sweep through the proximal aorta where we see vertebral bodies back here, very bright anterior edge with shadowing coming down behind it. 
anechoic area in the center of the uh, aorta, superior mesenteric artery coming off here, and celiac axis coming off up here a bit more superficial, uh, a bit more proximal towards the patient's head, which is on the left side of your screen here. So let's look at some abnormals. Sometimes they jump right out at you, but it's important to measure them as well because the measurement can be prognostic uh, as well as defining an aneurysm. So here we see a very large outer diameter. Anteriorly, this is the edge of the aorta, and posteriorly, this is the edge of the aorta. Notice that the inner diameter, the inner lumen, is much more narrow. That's not where you want to measure. Even though the inner caliber is where the blood's actually flowing through, you want to look at the outer diameter because the outer diameter of the, um, of the aorta is what responds to the pressures. And the larger the diameter, the greater the pressures going across the aorta. So uh, the uh, prognosis and the surgical interventions are all based on the outer diameter. And you can fool, get fooled occasionally um, because there can be a thick thrombus and clot around the edge and calcification. So if you only measure the inner diameter, you can have a patient with a five, six, seven centimeter aneurysm who has a two, two and a half centimeter inner diameter, and you certainly don't want to miss a patient like that because you measure the wrong part of the aorta. So here, more proximally, we see the vertebral body, again, shadowing coming down behind it in the, in the far field. And in the near field, we see the aorta with superior mesenteric artery coming off. And we see a couple things here. We actually see that there's an aneurysm and the uh, measurement here is probably six centimeters or so, definitely greater than three centimeters, and we see a little flap here that there's a dissection as well. So there's an aneurysm and a dissection here. Um, bedside sonography has a high sensitivity and specificity for ruling in or out abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's an excellent test for that. It's not as sensitive, um, although it's reasonably specific, for visualizing um, aortic dissection. So if that's in your differential and you don't see it on point of care sonography, consider other studies like a radiology CT scan, MRI, depending on what the um, uh, clinical scenario is for your patient. So here, another example where the calipers demonstrate this large uh, anechoic area just anterior to the uh, vertebral body. So there's another aneurysm measuring almost seven and a half by eight centimeters. And here, another one measuring probably about six or seven centimeters, this large round area up here. So you can see from these examples that finding the, um, or defining an aneurysm is not difficult. What actually winds up being more challenging in many cases is actually finding the aneurysm. So here's another example with a lot of clot and uh, hyperechoic material around inside the wall of the vessel. And here a longitudinal view demonstrating its largest diameter over six centimeters. And the ultrasound measurements correlate very well with CT measurements. So here's an example of the iliac bifurcation where the left iliac goes off in a normal caliber and the right iliac is um, aneurysmal here. And this was in a patient with um, a sensation of a cool right extremity. It was a little clammy compared to the other side. The patient had reasonable pulses and a very subjective change in sensation. So it was uh, the differential included neurologic as well as arterial um, processes going on. And the point of care ultrasound greatly expedited their care and uh, the consultation with vascular surgery and, and obtaining some more definitive imaging um, and moving this patient forward in their care in the emergency department. So there are several algorithms that have been described Typically, most people uh, argue that the, uh, the greatest utility um, harkens back to uh, Plummer's study where patients with a ruptured aneurysm get taken to the operating room much more quickly. So if you have a concern for abdominal aneurysm, you perform a point-of-care ultrasound. If it is negative, it's, again, a, a very good study for ruling out uh, aneurysm. So you can consider other uh, diagnostic uh, modalities and other differential diagnosis in your, in your patient. Now, when that study is positive, if you have an unstable patient, then a reasonable argument can be made that this patient be taken to the operating room. A hemodynamically unstable patient with a large abdominal aneurysm should get immediately uh, vascular surgery consultation, have large bore IVs placed, um, blood products, etc., and uh, really begin their resuscitation with an eye towards getting them to the operating room as quickly as possible. Now, a positive 
aorta ultrasound in the setting of a stable patient can certainly get more definitive imaging because you have that luxury and uh, surgical consultation as well. So, uh, as we mentioned before, you see the images aren't difficult to interpret. If the, the order is not hard to find, you just measure it, and if it's greater than three centimeters, it is aneurysmal. How much bigger than three centimeters it is, it can determine how worried you need to be about that patient. Typically, the most difficult thing that uh, providers have uh, with finding abdominal aneurysms is dealing with bowel gas and actually getting the proper images, especially if patients are, are larger. And so few patients fast prior to their examinations in the emergency department. Um, so here's a, an example of some foods that will tend to create a bit more bowel gas, and there's a couple ways we can deal with it. We can go around it. You can apply gentle, steady pressure. Some people like to um, hold some pressure down onto the probe gently and then sort of wiggle it a little bit to move the bowel gas away from the footprint of your ultrasound probe. Or you could just wait it out, look at another area, and come back to the area that was blocked before. So, you know, as an example of what we're looking at here, I think everyone would recognize that this is the Earth, and this is a globe, and this is what the continents look like. But um, satellite images don't look anything like this looks more like this. So in order to get a nice pretty picture of the Earth, you have to wait out the clouds and, and uh, use filters and basically go around them or wait them out. So very similar in the body. So when you're trying to scan the abdominal aorta and you know that there's bowel gas overlying it, you have to find that little break in the clouds, find that area where bowel gas isn't obscuring your view and getting uh, an air pocket in between your ultrasound probe and the underlying uh, anatomy underneath. So here's an example to illustrate the point. We can see here that we're putting the probe down into the patient from the anterior abdomen. On the left side of your screen here, you can sort of see the inferior vena cava and a bit of the vertebral body and its shadow behind it. But the right side is obscured by bowel gas. And what that's going to look like is a bright echogenic line that's going to typically be somewhat irregular and then shadowing all the way down behind it. So if you think about it, the right side of the probe, if you're sort of facing the patient getting this image, the right side of your probe is encountering bowel gas. And the left side of your probe is encountering a reasonable acoustic window. So if you move the probe towards the area that you have a good acoustic window, like this, angle around that bowel gas, you can then get a very different image. And what the image is going to look like when you move the probe to this position is going to be more like this. So now the bowel gas is further away towards the right side of your screen, and you're able to get a better window, and now you can visualize the aorta, the IVC, and the vertebral body reasonably well. Again, the same technique um, of keeping your probe in that position could be applied to either angling back and forth to try to find an angle on the abdominal aorta, or just maintain steady, gentle pressure. Or you could go more distal, have a look at the iliac bifurcation, for example, work your way back up again more proximally, and the bowel gas may have moved out of your way. So with that in mind, let's, uh, we've already spoken about the um, abdominal aorta, its anatomy, how to find it, how to measure it, and the importance of measuring the distal part of the abdominal aorta as well as into the iliacs. So there's one uh, issue that comes up every now and then. In primary care environments, it's very important. In radiology world, it's very important. And uh, it's, it's come up a few times in the emergency medicine and, and acute care environments as well. Should we be screening for abdominal aneurysm? And it's interesting that the United States Preventive Services Task Force uh, recommends a one-time screening exam uh, for abdominal aneurysm for male patients over the age of 65 um, if they've ever smoked. And there's reasonable evidence behind this, meaning it's a class B recommendation um, to do this. And why is this? Well, we see a lot of patients, and we see a lot of men, and we see a lot of men over 65, and a lot of men over 65 who've smoked. So of all these patients, is there an aortic aneurysm hiding out in there someplace? And that's really the definition of a screening examination. So not that we would be looking for patients with abdominal pain, syncope, flank pain, uh, the typical sort of symptoms to make you think of aneurysm, but is there any role for a screening ultrasound in evaluating any particular patient population? So um, the reason why we might want to look at men over the age of 65 is that they smoked when they were younger, and this has long-term ramifications for their, um, for their aorta, as well as other atherosclerotic disease, COPD, uh, et cetera. So uh, this is sort of the stereotype of members of the greatest generation uh, who, when they were younger, may have had a few cigarettes.
So what does Cochrane have to say about this? So there are some studies, and Cochrane has reviewed them. And in 2011, which is the last time that this was visited, um, there was an assessment of whether it would be useful to screen for abdominal aneurysm. And uh, there's three uh, acute care studies looking at males over the age of 65, and anywhere between 5.7 um, to 6.7% of patients screened in this age group were actually found to have aneurysms a small percentage of which required a, a emergent or urgent intervention, um, the remainder of which were um, uh, referred to their primary care doctors, vascular surgeons, et cetera, for follow-up and uh, tracking the, um, the aneurysms over time. So in summary, we want to think about abdominal aortic aneurysm with abdominal pain and flank pain, as most of us do. We certainly want to think about it in cases when you're thinking about renal colic. Um, and uh, it's worth when you're having a look at the kidneys and looking for hydronephrosis in a patient um, who's a little bit older and might have some cardiovascular risk factors to have a look at their aorta as well and not confuse uh, flank pain and even hematuria, that it must be renal colic and limit your assessment of their abdominal aorta. But also it's worth considering in syncope. Again, I'm not recommending that every patient with syncope has their aorta screened, um, but uh, that is a group of patients who, uh, in whom um, uh, aortic aneurysm actually has been found in, uh, in reasonable numbers, um, up to 10% in some studies of patients with um, syncope, uh, the abdominal aneurysm has been uh, pinpointed as the cause. Make sure you image the entire aorta from the point when it uh, uh, exits the diaphragm uh, proximally until the point of bifurcation at the iliac vessels around the level of the umbilicus distally. And again, keep in mind that most of aortic aneurysms are going to happen distally. Aorta should be less than 3 centimeters. Iliac vessels should be less than 1.5 centimeters. Make sure you measure the outer wall to the outer wall so that you don't miss um, by just looking at the inner diameter of the aorta. And finally, the biggest enemy for you is going to be bowel gas. So make sure that you're either patient with it, let it uh, scoot away uh, through peristalsis, or apply uh, slowly, gently uh, pressure, or wiggle the probe around to move it out of the way, and try to seek a window where there's not bowel gas in your way. So for more tips and tricks for a, uh, uh, images and more abnormals uh, regarding abdominal aortic aneurysm, tutorials, and other posts, uh, please visit www.sinaiem.us, which is our department's uh, ultrasound division website. And you can contact me or our division through the contact form on that page as well. Thank you.